Good morning. Dr. Andrew Siegel, urologist from Hackensack, New Jersey, doing an educational video on how to prevent stress urinary incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse. Much of my practice deals with these uh, subjects. Stress incontinence, which is defined as leakage of urine with sneezing, coughing, laughing, running, exercising, exertional activities, and pelvic prolapse, also known as pelvic relaxation, which essentially is weakness of the support tissues that allow prolapse of one or more of the pelvic organs into and outside of the vagina. This can involve the bladder, the uterus, small intestine, rectum, all of the above. Since most of my practice is treating these problems after the fact, I thought it would be useful to try to go over some of the risk factors in order to help best prevent the problem from starting in the first place. Because this is a big issue. And it's a mechanical issue, and the vast majority of the time, if it's significant, it will end up resulting in surgery. And it would be wonderful to be able to uh, avoid an operation, be proactive and preemptive, and help prevent the problem from the get-go. Okay. So, let's discuss some risk factors. The number one risk factor is pregnancy, labor, and delivery, clearly. It's rare to see a woman with stress urinary incontinence or significant prolapse who is not given birth to a child unless she has a lot of other factors that result in increased abdominal pressure such as uh, chronic straining from constipation. So women want to get pregnant, we want to get married, reproduce, have families, what can we do? Well, some people do elective cesarean sections, meaning a cesarean section that does not occur after prolonged labor, but a decision with your gynecologist to have a cesarean from the very beginning. Now, I'm not advocating this at all, but I'm just mentioning this as a possibility. There are certain cultures in the world, uh, some of the more affluent areas, for example, of Brazil, where the elective cesarean section rate is very, very high because this particular subpopulation values preservation of vaginal anatomy, avoiding such problems as stress incontinence and prolapse. Okay, what are some of the other risk factors for stress urinary incontinence? Chronic increase in abdominal pressure is a big risk factor. So I mentioned earlier constipation. So if you can do anything to avoid pushing and struggling with bowel movements, it will be in your great interest. Because if you think about it, if you're pushing and struggling every day, it's really not a whole lot different from being in labor, except that it's a shorter period of time, yet it's chronic. And that can be a huge factor. So whatever it takes to avoid pushing and straining with bowel movements. So healthy diet, lots of whole grains, vegetables, fruits, legumes, exercise, whatever it takes. Other factors menopause, aging, can't do much about them, gynecological surgery, including hysterectomy, obviously try to avoid surgery if possible. I mentioned any condition that could uh, give rise to increase in abdominal pressure. I specifically mentioned straining with bowel movements and constipation, but there are others. Chronic coughing from smoking, so obviously Smoking is a risk factor. By eliminating smoking, can help prevent the problem from occurring. Asthma, allergies, chronic sneezing. So 
by treating the inciting condition, we can help prevent the, the problem from occurring. Certain occupations have a predilection for stress incontinence and pelvic prolapse. For example, anybody who lifts heavy weights, nurses who transfer patients, for example, women who are weight trainers, any chronic straining can weaken the pelvic support. Let's take a break for a second and discuss a little bit of anatomy. I am going to use as a crude example of pelvic anatomy a box. Open at one end, close at the other. This box is a good representation of the vagina. The vagina essentially is sock-like with a closed end and an open end. It's a tube, if you will. It's got an apex, which is the deep wall. It's got a roof and it's got a floor. So a cystocele, a drop bladder, is defined as a weakness of the support tissues between the bladder and the roof, allowing the bladder to descend down into the vagina and when it's extreme, outside the vagina. In similar fashion, a rectocele is defined as a weakness of the support tissue between the rectum and the floor of the vagina, allowing the rectum to herniate or prolapse into the vagina and at its extreme, outside the vagina. Similarly, uterine prolapse or cervical prolapse can result when there's weakness of the support to the apical tissues, tissues at the apex, the deep area, allowing the uterus and cervix to work their way down through the vaginal tube and sometimes even out. When there's not a uterus present, it is possible for small intestine to work their way down through the apex and out. Now, stress incontinence is really part of this same continuum. It is simply weakened support tissues of the tissues underlying the urethra, the channel going from the uh, bladder out to the opening. Now, this is a model of the female pelvis. Pubic bones, vagina, urethra, anal area. These are the superficial perineal muscles. This is the anal sphincter, the transverse perineal muscle, the ischiocavernous muscle, and the bulbocavernous muscle. That's one layer of support. The deeper layer of support inside goes from the sacrum to the pubic bone, and this large muscle is known as the levator ani, since it can lift the anus up. It has openings for the urethra, vagina, and the rectum. And when these muscles are exercised, These exercises are known as Kegel exercises or pelvic floor muscle exercises, and they are one of the key means of helping prevent both stress, urinary incontinence, as well as pelvic relaxation. I'm not going to belabor the details of how to do these exercises. I have a separate two videos on this subject. If you're interested, go to Bergen urological.com, B-E-R-G-E-N-U-R-O-L-O-G-I-C-A-L.com. That's our website. Click on patient videos and you'll have access to these. These are on YouTube, so they're readily available and they should prove very helpful. So, in addition to pelvic floor exercises, what else can help prevent stress incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse? Healthy eating helps everything. Heart, lungs, kidney, bladder, pelvic structures. Whole foods, 
plenty of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, eating moderately, our bodies are constantly undergoing repair and reconstruction. Bottom line, put good fuel into your system. It will make a difference. What else can help prevent stress incontinence and pelvic floor prolapse? Exercise. I mentioned specifically pelvic floor exercises, but just exercise in general, particularly core exercises, such as yoga and Pilates. These can prove very helpful for minor amounts of stress incontinence and pelvic pro prolapse in, in terms of actually improving them and can be extremely helpful in preventing the problems from starting from the get-go. Weight management, very, very important. You become obese, you put a lot of weight on, you put pressure on every area of the body. Your knees start hurting, your, your back goes out of whack, you put a great deal of pressure on the pelvis, it doesn't help the situation. So getting back in good physical shape is of utmost importance. I'm going to bring up estrogen replacement very briefly. It's got lots of controversies associated with it, but there's no question about it that after menopause, there's worsening progression of stress incontinence and pelvic prolapse. Estrogens play a supportive role in nurturing the vaginal and periurethral with the tissues, the tissues around the uh, urethra and bladder. So at times, using a low dose of a topical estrogen, that is one that is applied locally, that doesn't get much systemic absorption, can be useful. And that, my friends, is all I have to say. Bottom line is this. Stress incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse are very, very common problems, typically associated with pregnancy, labor, and delivery. Birth trauma essentially can do a great deal of damage to the pelvic floor structures. And even a cesarean section is not going to help if you've pushed and struggled for 24 hours. An elective cesarean section can make the difference, but this, in many people's opinion, is something that is very radical. That's stated in certain cultures of the world, especially affluent societies in South America, it is the norm. I will tell you as well that there are a great deal of women urologists and women gynecologists who do elective sections. And they are in the know, obviously, period. Aside from that, general measures, healthy eating, weight maintenance, avoidance of weight gain, avoidance of constipation, avoidance of chronic increases in abdominal pressure, all can be extremely helpful in preventing stress, incontinence, as well as pelvic relaxation. Thank you very much for your attention.